The Battle of Goose Green was an engagement between British and Argentine forces on 28 and the 29th of May 1982 during the Falklands War. Located on East Falklands, Central Isthmus, the settlement of Goose Green was the site of an airfield. Argentine forces were in a well-defended position, within striking distance of San Carlos Water, where the British task force had made its amphibious landing. The main body of the British assault force was the 2nd Battalion, Parachute Regiment, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Herbert Jones. BBC Radio broadcast news of the imminent attack on Goose Green. Knowing that this had likely forewarned the Argentinian defenders, the broadcast provoked immediate criticism from Jones and other British personnel. After the attack began in the early hours of 28 May 1982, the two para advance was stalled by fixed trenches with interlocking fields of fire. Jones was killed during a solo charge on an enemy machine gun post. The Argentinian garrison agreed to a ceasefire and formally surrendered the following morning. As a result of their actions, both Jones and his successor as commanding officer of the battalion, Major Chris Keeble, were awarded medals, Jones received a posthumous Victoria Cross and Keeble received the Distinguished Service Order. Chapter 1, Prelude Chapter 1 Section 1, Terrain and Conditions Goose Green and Darwin are on a narrow isthmus connecting Lafonia, to the south, with Wickham Heights in the north. The isthmus has two settlements, Darwin Village to the north and Goose Green to the south. The terrain is rolling and treeless and is covered with grassy outcrops, areas of thick gorse and peat bogs, making camouflage and concealment extremely difficult. The islands have a cold, damp climate and from May to August the ground is saturated and frequently covered with salty water, making walking slow and exhausting, particularly at night. Drizzly rains occur two out of every three days, with continuous winds and periods of rain, snow, fog, and sun change rapidly. Sunshine is minimal, leaving few opportunities for troops to warm up and dry out. Chapter 1 Section 2 Background. The bulk of the Argentine forces on the islands were in positions around Port Stanley, 50 miles to the east of the Isthmus and San Carlos, the site of the main British landings. An Argentinian force had been deployed to Goose Green and Darwin and they were supported by artillery, mortars, 35mm cannon, and machine guns. British intelligence incorrectly indicated that the Argentine force presented limited offensive capabilities and did not pose a major threat to the landing area at San Carlos. Consequently, the Goose Green garrison seemed to have no strategic military value for the British in their campaign to recapture the islands and the initial plans for land operations had called for Goose Green to be isolated and bypassed. Dot after the British landings at San Carlos on 21 May and while the bridgehead was being consolidated, British activities were limited to digging fortified positions, patrolling, and waiting, during this time Argentine air attacks caused significant damage to, and loss of, British ships in the area around the landing grounds. These attacks and the lack of breakout by the landed forces out of the San Carlos area led to a feeling among senior commanders and politicians in the UK that the momentum of the campaign was being lost. As a result, British joint headquarters in the UK came under increasing pressure from the British government for an early ground offensive for political and propaganda value. There was also UN pressure for a ceasefire and the UK government position was that the taking of the Darwin Goose Green Isthmus was imperative before any such ceasefire decision as it would allow British forces to control access to the entire Lafonia, and thus a significant portion of East Falkland. On 25 May Brigadier Julian Thompson, Ground Forces Commander, Commanding 3 Commando Brigade, was ordered to mount an attack on Argentine positions around Goose Green and Darwin. Chapter 1 Section 3, Argentinian Defenses The defending Argentine forces, known as Task Force Mercedes, consisted of two companies of Lieutenant Colonel Italo Piogi's 12th Infantry Regiment, his third company was still deployed on Mount Kent as combat team Solari, and only rejoined 12 years after the fall of Goose Green Airfield. The task force also contained a company of the Ranger Type 25th Infantry Regiment. 
Air defense was provided by a battery of six 20mm Rheinmetall anti-aircraft guns, manned by Air Force personnel and two radar-guided Orlikon 35mm anti-aircraft guns from the 601st Anti-Aircraft Battalion. Both the 20mm and 35mm anti-aircraft cannon could also be used in a direct fire ground support role, and this was the case in the last stages of the fighting. There was also one battery of three Otto Malara Mod 56 plus 105mm pack howitzers from the 4th Airborne Artillery Regiment. Pukara aircraft, based at Stanley and armed with rockets and napalm could provide close air support. The total forces under Pioggi's command numbered 1,083 men. Pioggi's role was to provide a reserve battle group in support of other forces deployed to the west of Stanley and secondly to occupy and defend the Darwin Isthmus as well as the military air base Condor at Goose Green. He deployed the two companies in an all round defense with A Company, 12 ear the key to his defense, they were deployed along a gorse hedge running across the Darwin Isthmus from Darwin Hill to Bokar House. He deployed his recce platoon as an advance screen forward of 12 Years A Company, towards Coronation Ridge, while 12 Years C Company were deployed south of Goose Green to cover the approaches from Lafonia. To substitute for the absent B Company, he created a composite company from headquarters and other staff and deployed them in Goose Green Hamlet. 25 Years C Company provided a mobile reserve, from the schoolhouse in Goose Green. Elements were also deployed to Darwin Settlement, Salinas Beach, and Bokar House and the Air Force Security Cadets, together with the anti-aircraft elements, were charged with protecting the airfield. Minefields had been laid in areas deemed tactically important, to provide further defense against attack. On paper Pioggi had a full regiment, but it consisted of units from three separate regiments from two different brigades, none of whom had ever worked together. 12 ear consisted mostly of conscripts from the northern, subtropical province of Corrientes, while the 25 ear company was considered an elite formation and had received commando training. Some elements were well trained and displayed a high degree of morale and motivation, with Lieutenant Ignacio Goritay of B Company 12 ear remarking that there was no need for speeches. From the beginning, we knew how important the Mall Venus were. It was a kind of love we were going to defend something that was ours. Other units were less well motivated, with the 12th Regiment Chaplain, Santiago Mora, writing. The conscripts of 25th Infantry wanted to fight and cover themselves in glory. The conscripts of the 12th Infantry Regiment fought because they were told to do so. This did not make them any less brave. On the whole, they remained admirably calm. The Argentine positions were well selected, and officers well briefed. In the weeks before the British invasion, airstrikes, naval bombardment, their own poor logistic support and inclement conditions had contributed to the erosion of morale amongst conscripts. However, morale remained strong among the 4th Airborne Artillery Regiment gunners as well the officers, NCOs and Ranger-trained conscripts of the 12th and 25th Regiments. On the 19th of May, an Argentine Air Force C-130 Hercules parachuted in eight tons of tinned provisions that significantly boosted the morale of Task Force Mercedes. At the start of the battle, the Argentinian forces had about the same number of effective combatants as the British paratroopers. Chapter 1 Section 4 British Forces Thompson ordered 2nd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment to conduct an attack on Goose Green as they were the unit closest to the isthmus in the San Carlos defensive perimeter. He ordered Lt. Col. Herbert H. Jones, the commanding officer of 2 Para, to carry out a raid on Goose Green Isthmus and capture the settlements before withdrawing to be in reserve for the main thrust to the north. The capture component appealed more to Jones than the raid component, although Thompson later acknowledged that he had assigned insufficient forces to rapidly execute the capture part of the orders. Two para consisted of three rifle companies, one patrol company, one support company, and an HQ company. Thompson had assigned three 105mm artillery pieces, with 960 shells from 29 Commando Regiment, Royal Artillery, one Milan anti-tank missile platoon, and scout helicopters as air support. 
Close air support was available from three Royal Air Force Harriers and naval gunfire support was to be provided by HMS Arrow in the hours of darkness. Chapter 1 Section 5 Attack Plan An SAS survey had reported that the Darwin Goose Green area was occupied by one Argentine company. Brigade intelligence reported that enemy forces consisted of three infantry companies, one platoon from eight ear, plus a possible amphibious platoon together with artillery, and helicopter support. Jones was not too perturbed by the conflicting intelligence reports and, incorrectly, tended to believe the SAS reports on the assumption that they were actually on the spot and were able to provide more accurate information than the brigade intelligence staff. Based on this intelligence and the orders from Thompson, Jones planned the operation to be conducted in six phases, as a complicated night day, silent noisy attack. C Company was to secure the start line, and then? A company was to launch the attack from the start line on the left side of the isthmus. B Company would then launch their attack from the start line directly after A Company had initiated contact and would advance on the right side of the isthmus. Once A and B companies had secured their initial objectives, D Company would advance from the start line between A and B companies and were to take defense positions once having reached their objective. This would be followed by C Company, who would pass through D Company and neutralize any remaining Argentine reserves. C Company would then advance again and clear the Goose Green airfield and the settlements of Darwin and Goose Green would be secured by A and D Companies respectively. As most of the helicopter airlift capability had been lost with the sinking of SS Atlantic Conveyor, two para were required to march the 13th miles from San Carlos to the forming up place at Camilla Creek House. C Company and the commando engineers moved out from the forming up place at 2200 hours on the 27th of May to clear the route to the start line for the other companies. A fire base was established by support company west of Camilla Creek, who were in position by 2 o'clock on the morning of the 28th of May. The three guns from 8 Battery, their crew, and ammunition had been flown into Camilla Creek House by 20 Sea King helicopter sorties after last light on the evening of the 27th of May. The attack was to be initiated by A Company and was scheduled to start at 3 o'clock, but because of delays in registering the support fire from HMS Arrow, the attack only commenced at 3.35. Chapter 1 Section 6 Initial Contact As part of the diversionary raids to cover the British landings in the San Carlos area on 21 May the British conducted a naval bombardment and launched air attacks on Goose Green. In addition, the squadron of the SAS, mounted a major raid to simulate a battalion-sized attack on A Company 12 ear who were dug in on Darwin Ridge. The SAS raid was launched from their assembly point on Mount Usborne, the following day, the 22nd of May, four RAF Harriers, armed with cluster bombs, were launched from Hermes to attack the fuel dumps and pukaras at Condor Airfield at Goose Green. The Harriers met intense anti-aircraft fire during their attack. On the night of 26-27 May, two rifle platoons from Manresa's A Company mounted a retaliatory raid on the SAS positions on Mount Osborne, but on reaching the summit were surprised to find that the SAS had already vacated the feature. The next day an Argentine officer on Darwin Ridge spotted British troops conducting reconnaissance patrols and an 12-ear platoon fired on the patrol with long-range machine gun fire in the hours before the start of the attack dot throughout the 27th of May. Royal Air Force Harriers were active over Goose Green. One of them, responding to a call for help from Captain Paul Farrar's C Company, was lost to 35mm fire while attacking Darwin Ridge. The preliminary fire, probing patrols and SAS raid, the Harrier attacks, the sighting of the forward British paratroopers, and the BBC announcing that the 2nd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment was poised and ready to assault Darwin and Goose Green the day before the assault alerted the Argentine garrison to the impending attack. Chapter 2 – Battle Chapter 2 – Section 1 – Darwin Parks At 3.35 a.m. HMS Arrow opened fire, firing a total of 22 star shells and 135 rounds of 4.5 inches high explosive shells during a 90-minute bombardment, signaling the start of the attack. Two para company, 
under command of Major Farah Hockley were first to advance after the completion of the preparatory fire from HMS Arrow. They were to take Burntside House as their first objective. They came under fire from Argentinian positions close to the house but managed to reach the objective without any casualties, finding that it was occupied by four Falklanders and that the house itself had never been held by the Argentinian forces. They were instructed to wait at Burntside House, instead of exploiting their favorable position and advancing further. B Company, under command of Major John Crossland followed in the next phase of the attack and were to secure Burntside Hill and then to continue to Bokar Hill. Where a company had advanced down the left side of the isthmus, B Company were to follow the coast on the right side of the attack. After a significant delay, they advanced and initially encountered very little resistance. Approaching the hill, they exchanged fire with Argentine forces and on reaching the top of the hill, they found the positions empty. The Argentinian account states that the platoons of sub-lieutenants Marcelo Martin Bracco, and Alejandro Gara came under heavy probing fire and the platoons withdrew after the initial clashes. The platoon under sub-lieutenant Gustavo Adolfo Malacolza fought a delaying action against the British paratroopers before taking withdrawing to new positions on Darwin Ridge. The Coronation Ridge position temporarily halted Major Philip Neen's D Company as they advanced between A and B companies. They encountered heavy fire from an Argentinian machine gun which was attacked and silenced by two paratroopers, for which they would be awarded decorations for bravery. With this machine gun out of action, D Company were able to continue to clear the Argentine platoon position on Coronation Ridge but lost three men in taking the hill. At around 7.30 am, the 1st Rifle Platoon from the 25 ERC Company under the command of 2nd Lieutenant Roberto Estevez, received orders to counterattack against 2 Paris B Company. The Argentine platoon was able to block the British advance by taking up positions on Darwin Hill, from which, although wounded, Estevez started calling down fire support from Argentine 105mm artillery and 120mm mortars. This indirect fire held up the advance of two Paris A Company, especially as they were in open ground on the forward slope of the hill as they prepared to take up their advance once again. A company was forced to take cover in the nearby trenches. Estevez continued to direct the Argentinian artillery fire until was killed by sniper fire. Him and his radio operator, Private Fabricio Edgar Carascul were both posthumously decorated for their actions. Private Guillermo Hercapan from Estevez's platoon describes the morning action. Lieutenant Estevez went from one side to the other organizing the defense until all at once they got him in the shoulder. But with that and everything, badly wounded, he kept crawling along the trenches, giving orders, encouraging the soldiers, asking for everyone. A little later, they got him in the side, but just the same, from the trench, he continued directing the artillery fire by radio. There was a little pause, and then the English began the attack again, trying to advance, and again we beat them off. The British a company assault had been stopped by fire from an 12 ear platoon after their platoon sergeant had observed the British approach and yelled out a warning. Major Farrar Hockley then spotted Argentine reinforcements on the hills before him and shouted, Ambush! Take cover! Just as the 12 ear platoon's machine guns opened fire. The Royal Engineer officer attached to Farrar Hockley's company, Lieutenant Clive Livingston, wrote about the initial fight for Darwin Hill. A massive volume of medium machine gun fire was unleashed on us from a range of about 400 meters. The light now rapidly appearing enabled the enemy to identify targets and bring down very effective fire. Although this too would work for us, the weight of fire we could produce was not in proportion to the massive response it brought. We stopped firing, our main concern was to move away whenever pauses occurred in the attention being paid to us. The two platoons were not able to suppress the trenches, which were giving us so much trouble. We took about 45 minutes to extract ourselves through the use of smoke and pauses in the firing. The A Company paras were in the gorse line at the bottom of Darwin Hill facing the entrenched Argentines, who were looking down the hill at them. They were pinned down by heavy machine gun and automatic rifle fire as well as sniper fire for an hour, between 9 and 10 am. 
Two Parasby Company also broke off their attacks and began to withdraw to the reverse side of Middle Hill and the base of Coronation Point. Their defense and the reorganization of the attack was organized by two Paras second in command. The British A and B companies couldn't get across the open ground to get at the Argentinian machine guns and snipers and after five hours of fighting, their ammunition supply was becoming critical. Nevertheless, the Paras called on the Argentines to surrender. Chapter 2 Section 2 Death of H. Jones With both A and B Company's advance halted and the entire attack in jeopardy, the two para commander, Lieutenant Colonel Jones led an unsuccessful charge up a small gully to try to regain the initiative. Three of his men, his adjutant Captain Wood, a company's second-in-command Captain Dent, and Corporal Hardman, were killed when they followed his charge. Shortly after that, Jones was seen to run west along the base of Darwin Ridge to a small re-entrant, followed by his bodyguard. He checked his Sterling submachine gun, then ran up the hill towards an Argentine trench. He was seen to be hit once, then fell, got up, and was hit again from the side. He fell meters short of the trench, shot in the back and the groin, and died within minutes. Jones was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. As Jones lay dying, his men radioed for urgent casualty evacuation. However, the British scout helicopter sent to evacuate Jones was shot down by an Argentine FMA, IA-58 Pucara ground attack aircraft. The pilot, Lt. Richard Nunn RM was killed and posthumously received the DFC, and the air crewman, Sergeant Bill Belcher RM was severely wounded in both legs. While returning from this attack, the Pucara crashed into Blue Mountain and its pilot, Lt. Miguel Jimenez, was killed. His remains were not recovered until 1986 and the cause of the crash remains unknown. Jones's death was attributed to an Argentine army commando sniper identified as Corporal Osvaldo Faustino Olmos. However, historian Hugh Bicino attributed Jones's death to Corporal Jose Luis Rios of the 12th Regiment's reconnaissance platoon. Rios was later fatally wounded manning a machine gun in his trench by Obols, who fired a 66mm rocket dot with the death of Jones, command passed to Major Chris Keeble. Following the failure of this initial attack and the death of Jones, it took Keeble an additional two hours to reorganize and resume the attack. Former para-officer and military theorist Spencer Fitzgibbon wrote in 1995 that despite his undoubted courage, H. Jones did more to hinder than to help two para, losing sight of the overall battle picture and failing to allow his subunit commanders to exercise mission command, before his fatal attempt to lead A Company forward from the position where they had become bogged down. Chapter 2 Section 3, Darwin Hill By the time of Jones's death, it was 10.30, and Major Dare for our Hockley's A Company made a third attempt to advance, but this petered out. Eventually, the British Company, hampered by the morning fog as they advanced up the slope of Darwin Ridge, were driven back to the gully by the fire of the survivors of the first platoon from 25 years he company. During that morning fighting, two Paras mortar crews fired 1,000 rounds to support the attacks, preventing the Argentines' fire from being properly aimed. Many of the Argentine fatalities during the fighting were caused by mortar fire. The Argentinians requested close air support and were expecting a strike by Argentine Air Force, Skyhawk fighter bombers in support of the Darwin Ridge defenders. Company Sergeant Major Juan Cuelo spread out white bedsheets in front of the trenches to mark the front line of Argentinian troops, but was severely wounded in the process. On their approach to the islands, the Argentine flight of five Skyhawks observed the British hospital ship Uganda, and lost considerable time reporting and investigating the presence of the Red Cross marked ship. The Skyhawk pilots, having lost much fuel and flying in bad weather, then carried out a poorly executed bomb run in support of the Darwin defenders but mistakenly fired on Argentine positions as they released their bombs. They were engaged by Argentine anti-aircraft fire that damaged the lead aircraft, it was almost noon before the British advance resumed. A company cleared the eastern end of the Argentine position and opened the way forward towards Goose Green settlement. There had been two battles for the Darwin Hillocks, 
one around Darwin Hill looking down on Darwin Bay, and an equally fierce fight in front of Boca Hill. Sub-Lieutenant Guillermo Ricardo Oliaga's 3rd platoon of 8 years C Company held Boca Hill but by 1347. And after fierce fighting, the position was taken by Major John Crossland's B Company, with support from the Milan anti-tank platoon. About the time of the final attack on the Boca House position, a company overcame the Argentine defenders on Darwin Hill, finally reporting taking the Black Strong Point at 1313 and advanced to take Strong Point White after securing White. The battle for Darwin Ridge was over and the Paras had belatedly secured their interim objectives after six hours of fighting. But with grievous loss, the commanding officer, the adjutant, a company second in command and nine non-commissioned officers and soldiers were killed and several wounded. Chapter 2 Section 4, Attack on the Airfield After securing Darwin Ridge, C and D companies began to make their way to the small airfield, as well as to Darwin School, while B company made their way south of Goose Green Settlement. A company remained on Darwin Hill. C Company took heavy losses when they became the target of intense direct fire from 35mm anti-aircraft guns from Goose Green. Private Mark Holman Smith, a signaller in the company headquarters, was killed by anti-aircraft fire while trying to recover a heavy machine gun from wounded Private Steve Russell. C Company's commander, Major Hugh Jenner, his signaller and eight other men were also wounded. In the airfield itself, Argentine Air Force anti-aircraft gunners under Lieutenant Dario del Valle Valazza, and the 12-year platoon under Sub-Lieutenant Carlos Osvaldo Aldao, attempted to halt the renewed advance from Boca Hill, but eventually they were forced to abandon their positions, including the five remaining 20mm Rheinmetall guns at Condor Airfield, losing two of these cannon destroyed as well as the Elta radar to Milan missiles or mortar fire. A large part of the 12-year platoon was overrun and forced to surrender, but Aldao, along with a corporal, managed to escape in the confusion of the Argentine airstrikes that materialized later that afternoon. Private John Graham, from Lieutenant Chris Waddington's No. 11 platoon, claimed that Lieutenant Barry and Corporal Sullivan, during a local truce, went forward to accept the Argentine surrender at the airfield, and that the defenders suddenly opened fire without warning killing Barry and wounding Sullivan, with one Argentine crawling forward to Sullivan and shooting him at point-blank range. I saw the white flag incident, I was in 11 platoon. We were going up the hill, and the flag went up. The officer called the sergeant and then got halfway up the hill. Bang! They let rip into them, killed them. One guy was hit in the knee and one of the bastards came forward and shot him in the head. He moved forward out of his position and shot him. According to Sub-Lieutenant Gomez, Centurion. I set out with thirty-six men toward the north. Passing the school, we entered a depression from which we saw the hill. I sent a scouting party ahead, and they told me that the British were advancing from the other side of the low ridge, some one hundred and fifty men. Men were very tense, there was a brutal cold, we shivered with cold, with fear. When they were about fifty meters away, we opened fire. We kept firing for at least forty minutes. They started to attack our flank, my soldiers had to take cover, the firing went down, and the situation started to become critical. Then we were surrounded, we had wounded, people started to lose control. I began to ask about casualties, each time, more casualties. There was no way out behind because we had been flanked, nearly surrounded. So when there was a pause in the firing, I decided that it was the time to stop, and I gave the order to disengage. The 25-year platoon defending the airfield fell back into the Darwin Goose Green track and was able to escape. Sergeant Sergio Ismail Garcia of 25 year single handedly covered the withdrawal of his platoon during the British counterattack. He was posthumously awarded the Argentine Nation to the Valor in Combat Medal. Under orders from Major Carlos Alberto Frontera, Sub Lieutenant Cesar Alvarez Barrow's 12 year platoon took up new positions and helped cover the retreat of Gomez Centurion's platoon along the Darwin Goose Green track. Four paras of D Company and approximately a dozen Argentines were killed in these engagements. 
Among the British dead were 29-year-old Lieutenant Barry and two NCOs, Lance Corporal Smith and Corporal Sullivan, who were killed after Barry's attempt to convince Sub-Lieutenant Gomez Centurion to surrender was rebuffed. C Company did not lose a single man in the Darwin School fighting, but Private Steve Dixon, from D Company, died when a splinter from a 35mm anti-aircraft shell struck him in the chest. The Argentine 35mm anti-aircraft guns under the command of Sub-Lieutenant Claudio Oscar Braghini reduced the schoolhouse to rubble after Sergeants Mario Abel Tarditi and Roberto Amado Fernandez reported to him that sniper fire was coming from the building dot at around this time. Three British Harriers attacked the Argentine 35mm gun positions. The Army radar-guided guns were unable to respond effectively because a piece of mortar shrapnel had earlier struck the generator for the firearms and fire control radar. This attack considerably lifted morale among the British paras. Although it was not known at the time, the Harriers came close to being shot down in their bomb run after being misidentified as enemy aircraft by Lieutenant Commander Nigel Ward and Flight Lieutenant Ian Mortimer of 801 Squadron. According to Lieutenant Braghini's report, and at least one British account, the Harrier strike missed their intended target, but the Argentine anti-aircraft guns were already out of action anyway. Meanwhile, the 12-year platoon, under Sub-Lieutenant Orlando Lucero, a platoon that Lieutenant Colonel Pioggi and Major Frontera had organized, using survivors from the earlier fighting, took up positions on Goose Green's outskirts and continued to resist, while supporting Air Force Pucara and Navy Ermaki aircraft struck the forward British companies. The Argentine pilots did not have much effect, suffering two losses, at 5 o'clock, when a Machi 339A was shot down by a blowpipe missile from the Royal Marines Air Defense Troop, killing Sub-Lieutenant Daniel Miguel. Just about 10 minutes later, another Pucara was shot down by small arms fire from two para, drenching several paratroopers with fuel and napalm, which did not ignite. Lieutenant Miguel Cruzado survived and was captured by British forces on the ground. Chapter 2 Section 5, Situation at Last Light on 28 May By last light, the situation for two para was critical. A company was still on Darwin Hill, north of the Gorse Hedge, B Company had penetrated much further south and had swung in a wide arc from the western shore of the Isthmus eastwards towards Goose Green. They were isolated and under fire from an Argentinian platoon and unable to receive mutual support from the other companies. To worsen their predicament, Argentine helicopters, a Puma, a Chinook and six Hueys, landed southwest of their position, just after last light, bringing in the remaining Company B of 12 ear from Mount Kent. B Company managed to bring in artillery fire on these new Argentinian reinforcements, forcing them to disperse towards the Goose Green settlement, while some re-embarked and left with the departing helicopters. For C Company, the attack had also fizzled out after the battle at the schoolhouse, with the company commander injured, the second in command unaccounted for, no radio contact, and the platoons, scattered with up to 1,200 meters between them. D Company had regrouped just before last light, and they were deployed to the west of the dairy, exhausted, hungry, low on ammunition, and without water. Food was redistributed, for A and C companies to share one ration pack between two men, but B and D companies could not be reached. At this time, a British helicopter casualty evacuation flight took place, successfully extracting C company casualties from the forward slope of Darwin Hill, while under fire from Argentine positions. Dot to Keeble, the situation looked precarious, the settlements had been surrounded but not captured, and his companies were exhausted, cold, and low on water, food, and ammunition. His concern was that the Argentine 12 Air B Company reinforcements, dropped by helicopter, would either be used in an early morning counterattack or used to stiffen the defenses around Goose Green. He had seen the C Company assault stopped in its tracks by the anti aircraft fire from Goose Green, and had seen the Harrier strikes of earlier that afternoon missing their intended targets. In an order group with the A and C Company commanders, he indicated his preference for calling for an Argentine surrender, rather than facing an ongoing battle the following morning. His alternative plan, 
if the Argentines did not surrender, was to flatten Goose Green with all available firepower and then launch an assault with all forces possible, including reinforcements he had requested from Thompson. On Thompson's orders, J Company of 42 Commando, Royal Marines, the remaining guns of 8 Battery, and additional mortars were helicoptered in to provide the necessary support. Chapter 2 Section 6 Surrender Once Thompson and 3 Brigade had agreed to the approach, a message was relayed by CB radio from San Carlos to Mr. Eric Goss, the farm manager in Goose Green, who, in turn, delivered it to Pioggi. The call explained the details of a planned delegation who would go forward from the British lines, bearing a message, to the Argentine positions in Goose Green. Pioggi agreed to receive the delegation. Soon after midnight, two Argentine Air Force Warrant Officer prisoners of war were sent to meet with Pioggi and to hand over the proposed terms of surrender. The conditions read that you unconditionally surrender your force to us by leaving the township, forming up aggressively, removing your helmets, and laying down your weapons. You will give prior notice of this intention by returning the PW under a white flag with him briefed as to the formalities by no later than 0830 hours local time. You refuse in the first case to surrender and take the inevitable consequences. You will give prior notice of this intention by returning the PW without his flag no later than 0830 hours local time. In the event and by the terms and conditions of the Geneva Convention and laws of war, you will be held responsible for the fate of any civilians in Darwin and Goose Green, and we by these terms do give notice of our intention to bombard Darwin and Goose Green. On receiving the terms, Kyoji concluded. The battle had turned into a sniping contest. They could sit well out of range of our soldiers' fire and, if they wanted to, raise the settlement. I knew that there was no longer any chance of reinforcements from the 6th Regiment's B Company. So I suggested to Wing Commander Wilson Pedroso that he talk to the British. He agreed reluctantly. The next morning, agreement for an unconditional surrender was reached. Pedroso held a short parade, and those on show then laid down their weapons. After burning the regimental flag, Pioggi led the troops and officers, carrying their personal belongings into captivity. Chapter 3 – Aftermath Chapter 3 – Section 1 – Impact on the Campaign In the week preceding the attack, the Argentinians had sunk four British ships, including the Atlantic conveyor containing vital airlift helicopters essential for the recapture of Stanley. This led the British government to question the lack of movement by their ground forces and London needed a sign of progress. The victory at Goose Green accomplished the political purpose of sustaining public support in Britain by a badly needed victory and the success marked a turning point in the campaign, as it emphasized the Argentine failure to thwart the establishment of a beachhead and subsequent breakout into the island. The Argentinians had counted on achieving at least a stalemate through air attacks and ground defenses, if not stopping the landings altogether. From this point onwards, the British forces were to retain the initiative in all successive battles. Chapter 3 Section 2 – Prisoners and Casualties between 45 and 55 Argentines were killed 32 from RI-12, 13 from Company C-25 ear, 5 killed in the platoon from RI-R-8, 4 Air Force staff, and 1 Navy service member and 86 were recorded as wounded. The remainder of the Argentine force was taken prisoner, and the wounded were evacuated to hospital ships via the medical post in San Carlos. Argentine dead were buried in a cemetery to the north of Darwin, Military Chaplain Mora and Sub Lieutenants Bracco and Gomez Centurion assisted burying the dead. Prisoners were used to clear the battlefield. In an incident, while moving artillery ammunition, the RI 12 Company platoon was engulfed in a massive explosion that left five dead or missing and ten seriously wounded. After clearing the area, the prisoners were marched to, and interned in, San Carlos. The British lost 18 killed and 64 wounded. The seriously injured were evacuated to the hospital ship SS Uganda. By the 3rd of June, the Gurkhas were deployed at Darwin and Goose Green. 
They were used in helicopter-borne operations to find Argentine patrols operating on the southern flank of the British advance to Port Stanley. This resulted in an encounter with a 10-man Army Air Force patrol that had been helicoptered to Egg Harbor House, an abandoned farmhouse in Lafonia, to shoot down British aircraft with SA-7 shoulder-launched missiles. On 7 June, a Sea King arrived with 20 Gurkhas to clear this outpost. On being ordered to lie down to be searched by the Gurkhas, all the wet and hungry Argentine soldiers, including Sergeant Badugo, did so, except the Air Force officer. A Gurkha rifleman, brandishing a 10 inches Kukri blade, threatened the Air Force officer with beheading, then Lieutenant Agati obeyed. Chapter 3 Section 3 Commanders Lieutenant Colonel Italo Angel Pioggi surrendered his forces in Goose Green on the Argentinian National Army Day. After the war, he was forced to resign from the army, and faced ongoing trials questioning his competence at Goose Green. In 1986, he wrote a book titled Ganzo Verde, in which he strongly defended his decisions during the war and criticized the lack of logistical support from Stanley. In his book, he said that Task Force Mercedes had plenty of 7.62mm rifle ammunition left, but had run out of 81mm mortar rounds, and there were only 394 shells left for the 105mm artillery guns. On 24 February 1992, after a long fight in both civil and military courts, Pioggi had his retired military rank and pay reinstated, as a full colonel. He died in July 2012. Lieutenant Colonel Herbert H. Jones was buried at IX Bay on 30 May. After the war, his body was exhumed and transferred to the British Cemetery in San Carlos. He was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. Major Chris Keeble, who took over command of two para when Jones was killed, was awarded the DSO for his actions at Goose Green. Keeble's leadership was one of the key factors that led to the British victory in that his flexible style of command and the autonomy he afforded to his company commanders were much more successful than the rigid control, and adherence to plan, exercised by Jones. Despite sentiment among the soldiers of two para for him to remain in command, he was superseded by Lieutenant Colonel David Robert Chandler, who was flown in from the UK to take command of the battalion. Chapter 4 – Awards and Citations Chapter 4 Section 1, Argentinian Forces First Lieutenant Roberto Nesta Estevez, posthumously awarded the Argentine Heroic Combat Valor Cross. He is buried at the Darwin Argentine Military Cemetery. Chapter 4 Section 2, British Forces Lieutenant Colonel Herbert H. Jones was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross for his actions during the battle. The Distinguished Service Order was awarded to Major C.B.P. Keeble, the battalion's second in command. The Military Cross was awarded to Major J.H. Crossland, O.C.B. Coy. Major C.D. Farrar Hockley, O.C. Coy. Lieutenant C.S. Connor, Recky P.L. Commander. Distinguished Conduct Medal was awarded to Corporal D. Obols for his daring charges, which turned the Darwin Hill battle. Sergeant J. C. Meredith, P. L. Sergeant, 12 Platoon, D. Company. Private S. Illingsworth was posthumously awarded the DCM. Chapter 5, Order of Battle. Chapter 5 Section 1, Argentine Forces. Below data is from Adkin, Goose Green, a battle to be fought to be won unless specifically indicated by additional citations. Chapter 5 Section 2, British Forces Below data is from Adkin, Goose Green, a battle to be fought to be won unless specifically indicated by additional citations. Postnominal letters refer to awards bestowed for actions during the Battle of Goose Green. Chapter 5 Section 3 Comparative Strengths. Below data is from Adkin, Goose Green, a battle to be fought to be won unless specifically indicated by additional citations. Chapter 6, BBC Incident. During the planning of the assault of both Darwin and Goose Green, 
the battalion headquarters were listening into the BBC World Service, when the newsreader announced that the 2nd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment was poised and ready to assault Darwin and Goose Green. This caused great trepidation among the commanding officers of the battalion, with fears that the operation was compromised. Jones became furious with the level of incompetence and told BBC representative Robert Fox he was going to sue the BBC, Whitehall, and the War Cabinet. Chapter 7, Field Punishments In the years after the battle, Argentine army officers and NCOs were accused of handing out brutal field punishment to their troops at Goose Green, and other locations, during the war. In 2009, Argentine authorities in Comodoro Rivadavia ratified a decision made by authorities in Rio Grande, Tierra del Fuego, announcing their intention to charge 70 officers and NCOs with inhumane treatment of conscript soldiers during the war. There was, however, false testimony that was used as evidence in accusing the Argentine officers and NCOs of abandonment, and Pablo Vassil, who had denounced the alleged perpetrators had to step down from his post as head of the Human Rights Sub-Secretariat of Corrientes Province. Other veterans were skeptical about the veracity of the accusations, with Colonel José Martiniano Duarte, an ex-601 commando company officer and decorated veteran of the Falklands War, saying that it had become fashionable for ex-conscripts to accuse their superiors of abandonment. Since the 2009 announcement was made, no one in the military, or among the retired officers and NCOs, has been charged, causing Vassal to comment in April 2014. For over two years we've been waiting for a final say on behalf of the courts, there are some types of crimes that no state should allow to go unpunished, no matter how much time has passed, such as the crimes of the dictatorship. Last year Germany sentenced a 98-year-old corporal for his role in the concentration camps in one of the Eastern European countries occupied by Nazi Germany. It didn't take into account his age or rank. Chapter 7 Section 1, Sources